welcome to exploring the beta distribution in context of the Bernoulli experiment. Okay, so if you haven't figured it out by now, we're doing the Bernoulli experiment over and over and over again so there's a nice context and we don't need to keep switching between experiment types. We're going to do that as soon as we get through all of this. Once we cover all the topics we need to, in this context, we're going to fly through the other ones because we know what we're looking for each time and we don't need to go back and define everything again. All right, so again, clue clearly defined outcomes. Uh, here's all of them that we've talked about before, um, and they're often called Bernoulli trials. Uh, the random variable is one for success or whatever you've defined one to be. Here's the probability distribution. Uh, the probability of success is P, and it has to be between 0 and 1. And you can also rewrite it like this. And we've seen that this gives us the following likelihood. All right, so last time we saw that if we had a beta prior on P, which is the probability of success, and beta has parameters alpha and beta, uh, the posterior was also beta, and that's going to have a special name later. Um, so the probability distribution for P, given the data, uh, this little tilde symbol here means distributed as. P is distributed as beta, alpha, beta. P, given the data, so this is the posterior, is distributed as beta, and then we have alpha plus the sum of the xi, beta plus n minus the sum of the xi. Now, I avoided showing you all the details, but... You notice that uh, there's quite a bit of mathematics involved here, and you'll keep seeing mathematics, but we'll keep skirting around it. All right, so we should probably learn more about the beta distribution and the properties in general, and then once we have that, then we can do the same things with other distributions. So let's just look at the beta distribution. This is what it looks like. It has two parameters, alpha and beta. They have to be greater than zero. Uh, these are the parameters of the distribution. So we can actually play with them. And that's all this video is about is what if I change the values of these? What does that do to alpha and beta? I mean, what does that do to the distribution of P? Uh, so here, a beta 1, 1. Okay, it looks like this. It's uniform over 0, 1. If you plug in the numbers into the original density, you will see that you end up with the value 1 which is not very exciting in this case. But anyway, that's what you end up with. And it's just any value is equally likely between 0 and 1, and maybe that's all you know. You might know that uh, values that are closer to 1 are more likely, but this nice linear increase along here is a beta 2, 1. Okay, linear increase over 0, 1. Uh, a beta 1, 2 is a linear decrease. Okay. Uh, just flips it around, and you're going to see a symmetry in these 1, 2, what these numbers do. There's going to be a, a, an interesting symmetry about them. I can put in a beta 2, 2, and now this becomes quadratic uh, with a maximum at 0.5. Okay, so that gives me an interesting way of pushing uh, most of the probability towards the middle. Uh, a beta 5, 1 looks like this. I didn't go to 2 and 3 and 4. I mean, I did 2, but all the other ones. Notice that it pushes even more probability uh, or more likelihood, higher likelihoods over here around 1. Uh, and again, beta 1, 5 it was sort of the mirror image of it. Uh, now you're more likely to be near 0. And the reason I'm telling you this is we have to specify prior information at some point. And you're going to ask yourself, do I have any idea where this thing is? Is it likely to be a low number, a high number? And often you do know that information. Uh, here's a beta 5.5, five, concentrated near a half. Uh, looks very different than a 2.2 two in the sense that these are flattened out here in what we would call the tails. Uh, go to a 10.10, 10, gets a little bit flatter, more flat, still concentrated, or the height is around 0.5. Uh, 100, 100, right? Nobody said they had to be small numbers. And notice how flat it is until it goes up and it comes down and gets flat again. Um, and then we can move it around. A beta 30, 70 pushed it over to around 0.3. Um, we can also notice that here 30 plus 70 is 100 and 30 over 100 is 0.3. And uh, this will help you later if you're thinking about 
Um, how do I specify this if I think it's around a specific value? Well, you can use this sort of idea to help you get yourself there. Is knowing that if I take the alpha and the beta and add them together, then alpha divided by alpha plus beta, or the 100, is about where the center is. Okay, flip it around, 70, 30. Again, now we have 70 divided by 100, which is 0.7. So uh, we're going to go back to our example. Uh, Allison uh, is interested in the proportion of university students who go to Mundo Coffee at least once per week. And if you notice, Starbucks, Mundo, Star, Moon, Buck, Doe, those are for deer. Uh, at least once a week, since the university has 34,000 students, sampling every student is impossible. She ties, decides to take a simple random sample of students and try to make a conclusion. So suppose Allison suspects that P is around 0.3 and establishes the following prior distribution. So she has here beta is er, the prior distribution for P is beta alpha equals 3, beta equals 7. Okay, then we go and we see some data, n equals 10, and then the sum of the xi is equal to 4. So if we put this together, we're going to end up with a beta 713, and we saw this last time. But now we can actually look at the pictures and see what happens. So um, notice that you start with the prior distribution, which is a beta 310. The likelihood in the data pushes our posterior to be a beta 713. And you can see how close these are, not close these are. You can see the prior distribution and the posterior distribution that arrived. Notice that the posterior has a much less likelihood uh, around 0.1, where the other one kind of just, the prior kind of just takes off from zero and starts going up. All right, and you can also, if you wanted to, plot these uh, means that are associated with it, and you can see how the mean shifted once we were given some data. And notice we were only given 10 pieces of data, but yet we can detect, or we can show that the shift in the mean is occurring. I wouldn't say we're detecting it because it's a posterior distribution. We're not trying to do a statistical inference on it. All right, and you can see that the prior is centered around 0.3 and the posterior is around 0.35. So in order to really be able to do much Bayesian work, now that we have posterior distributions, we need to learn more about properties of uh, distributions in order to really be able to make strong conclusions and inferences from it. And that's what we'll spend the next couple of videos doing, is learning how to work with these things. Um, so we're going to start easy, and then we'll get a little more complicated and a little more complicated. But once it gets complicated, we're going to let the computer start taking over and handling this for us. So we'll worry about that then, and we'll see you in the next video.